Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In the last several lectures, we've been discussing many of the challenges and troubles that confronted American troops as they attempted to wage this war in Vietnam in the mid-1960s. In this lecture, we'll continue talking about some of those challenges, talk about some of the engagements during this period, and some of the ways Americans tried to overcome those difficulties, including free fire zones. As I described in the previous lecture, many American attempts at search and destroy missions wound up in ambush. The enemy simply had too much information about where, when, and how the Americans were going to attack. One way that Westmoreland thought he might be able to get around that weakness was through launching massive attacks to force the enemy out into the open and fighting more on his terms. Beginning in September 1966, Westmoreland launched Operation Attleboro in the so-called Iron Triangle, a 60 square mile area about 20 miles northwest of Saigon. This was a traditional communist stronghold. Over two months, the Americans destroyed many miles of tunnels, claimed 1,100 enemy casualties, but still had not destroyed the main enemy force. The territory soon slipped back into Viet Cong control. In January 1967, Westmoreland attacked into the same area again, in Operation Cedar Falls. They removed the civilians from the area, then just laid waste to the whole region. One of the most notorious incidents was the town of Bensuk, which was completely leveled by the Americans, bulldozers and all. At Bensuk, some 6,000 civilians were evacuated and sent to a refugee center. Then the Americans leveled the town. Every hut, every building, every plant. Some 700 Viet Cong were killed, and 20 miles of tunnels were destroyed. But this accomplished little, little more than alienating the population. As one journalist described it, Westmoreland's strategy was, quote, like a sledgehammer on a floating cork. Somehow the cork refuses to stay down. Other similar operations followed. Massive amounts of American weaponry were expended. Casualties kept growing for the enemy, estimated at a 10 to 1 ratio or better for the Americans. But still the enemy kept coming back and no territory stayed permanently in American hands. By 1967, in part out of frustration, Westmoreland began to expand American technology to absurd levels. Operation Ranch Hand was reaching its heights. In total, it dumped nearly 19 million gallons of chemical poison over 6 million acres more than 20% of the entire land area of South Vietnam. Keep in mind that South Vietnam, this is the area that we're supposed to be protecting and defending. These were supposed to be American allies. And yet this is the land that's being poisoned. Crops being rendered useless, wells being poisoned and unusable. And many American forces themselves were affected by the chemicals that were being dumped on the countryside. It is also in 1965 and 66 that Westmoreland developed the idea of so-called free fire zones. In these areas, local Vietnamese would warn the civilians that an American attack was coming. This would give them time to leave, and then anyone left would be fair game and be considered the enemy. It doesn't take a military genius to sense some of the flaws with this method. Often, Flyers were dropped in advance to warn the civilians that the Americans were coming. But they were printed in English, and many of the native population either could not or did not read them. They didn't get the word. Others chose not to leave. This is like a hurricane warning in the United States, where even when you're told to evacuate, many people decide to stay. This is their home. They're willing to take the risk. And the Vietnamese were attached to the land and to their homes. Perhaps there wasn't enough warning given.
Perhaps the locals didn't get the message. Sometimes the warning was delivered only a few minutes before the attack itself. As a final note, it was very easy for the Viet Cong and enemy forces to pick up on the word that was being delivered, and thus, yet again, they would know exactly where and when the attacks were coming. As a final flaw, the free fire zones ultimately came to incorporate most of South Vietnam, so there came to be few places where the natives could go to escape from American vengeance. American troops increasingly would destroy entire villages suspected of harboring the Viet Cong. They would use Zippo lighters and burn down the whole village, poison the wells, and salt the fields. And again, keep in mind, these are the people the Americans are supposedly trying to help. One of the most notorious attacks occurred at Ben Tre. In February 1968, Viet Cong troops overran the village and dug into tunnels. In an awesome display of American firepower, ultimately the entire village was destroyed. 600 civilians were killed, 1,500 wounded, and 4,000 homeless. One major famously said after the attack, It became necessary to destroy the town in order to save it. The Arclight campaigns of B-52 bombing raids on South Vietnam brought perhaps even greater destruction. These were B-52 raids launched from very high altitudes where the peasants often couldn't even hear the planes and didn't know anything was coming. They were also so high up as to be rendered tactically useless. These were simply sweeping bombing attacks with little ability to distinguish between military targets and civilian targets. Civilian peasants suffered the bulk of the damage, not the Viet Cong or North Vietnamese. The village was the key to their culture, and American forces destroyed their way of life. The number of homeless reached some 3 million in 1967 and 4 million in 1968. Worse still, some 400,000 civilians were killed and a million wounded by the friendly fire of the United States between 1965 and 72. One third of the South Vietnamese population was either killed, wounded, or rendered homeless as a result of the American attacks. When journalist Neil Sheehan asked Westmoreland if the civilian casualties bothered him, the general replied, Yes, Neil, it is a problem, but it does deprive the enemy of the population, doesn't it? So the political intentions of the war became an utter failure. Not only was the United States not establishing a strong basis of political support in the South, it was driving away most of the population. There were pacification efforts as part of the war. The United States invested in education and health programs and agricultural development. Eventually, they started a program called the New Life Hamlet Program, which was yet another variation on the Strategic Hamlet Program with similar problems. It was replaced in 1966 by another program called the Really New Life Hamlet Program. These kind of efforts simply were not working. There were also efforts to win the, quote, hearts and minds of the South Vietnamese people. They studied the villages and did surveys, determining their needs. And yet, for every dollar spent on pacification, the United States spent nearly $100 on military operations. For every worker engaged in those programs, there were 60 engaged in the process of destroying the country. In our next lecture, we'll talk about one of the most notorious and difficult challenges of this period of the war, body counts.